The following is a special video presentation of the Hennepin County Library. Hi, welcome to a discussion with Ed McBain. I'm Bruce Southworth, a mystery book reviewer for Publishers Weekly and Brood Review of Mysteries. Um, Ed McBain has won the Mystery Writers of America Grand Master Award and is the author of over 100 novels, uh, either as Ed McBain or under his own name, uh, Evan Hunter. Of the uh, 87th Precinct novels, the most recent, uh, Romance, the 46th in that series, was just published April of 1995 by Warner Books. Another popular series features attorney Matthew Hope. The 11th in that series was published in 1994, There Was a Little Girl. As Evan Hunter, his works have shown great diversity, uh, starting with The Blackboard Jungle in 1954 through The Chisholms in 1976 to Lizzie in 1984, about the famous Lizzie Borden case in uh, the late 1890s. Uh, he's written short stories, children's stories, screenplays, including Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds and Strangers When We Meet and Fuzz, both of those being based on his own novels. And in March of 1995, NBC Television aired the first of Ed McBain's 87th Precinct series, starring Randy Quaid as uh, Detective Steve Carella. It is a great honor and pleasure to have you here. Thank you well, very I'm much. I'm very happy to be here. Um, romance is a delightfully fun book. It, it seems to have mm. so many different levels. Um, the aspect of, uh, well, let's uh, probably start to describe it better, I guess, first. There is a group of actors uh, in a play called Romance, and they are rehearsing a play called Romance within that. And uh, the lead actress is stabbed, but not fatally. And then at uh, a later date, she is, is stabbed fatally, which brings in Bert Kling and Detective Steve Carella and so on. And at another level, we have the relationship of uh, Bert Kling with a new lady in his life, uh, Deputy Chief Surgeon uh, Sharon Cook. Who, if she knows anything about his history, should run for the hills immediately. But it's one of the things that I really, really kind of liked about the book is that it, it doesn't seem to be as much police procedural, if you will. I mean, the, the 87th Precinct series seems to have is that, that um, yeah. genre. But it's more of a kind of a, a novel of relationships, a lot of relationships among people. Yeah, and uh, the mystery in it is more uh, of a pure mystery than, than some of the uh, uh, books preceding it have been, you know, where there's a uh, uh, actually... Uh, it could take place in in an Agatha Christie uh, drawing room where there is the cast of characters, uh, the, all mm -hmm. the people involved in the production of this play, and all of them are suspects more or less. And you know, where was Uncle Charlie uh, in the dining room when so and so was killed in the potting shed? That sort of mm -hmm. thing. Uh, so it's a, it's a purer mystery than than some of the others. It's also, as you mentioned a bit earlier. Uh, a more light-hearted mystery than, than I've been writing of late. Mm -hmm. um, I guess starting with the book called Lullaby, and I don't know when that was, four or five years ago, I guess, uh, where a child, a baby, is, a baby and her sitter are killed on New Year's Eve. Mm. Um, the book started to take on a much darker tone, a, a more pessimistic uh, look at American life, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, a sort of cranky grouchy um, view mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know what suddenly maybe I'm happier these days or, or <laughs> it's certainly not because Newt Gring Gingrich is at the helm there uh, but uh, it, it I may be happier these days and and this book I think reflects it it's springtime in the 87 precinct mm -hmm. and flowers are blooming and romance is blooming and yeah, it's and the play is a lousy play with, with a lousy actor and a lousy actress and and a lousy writer. <laughs> a lousy writer, incidentally, and um, so I had a lot of fun writing the book, and I think it shows in the pages. Oh, absolutely! I think it's one of the delights. Is it, it seems as though you're you're almost taking some some fun stabs at the uh, the theat no pun intended, sorry, uh, <laughs> the theatrical yes. people as well as writers in general, um, as, as well as the mystery genre. The, yeah, uh, I, I figured if I did a number on the director and the producer and the various actors and actresses in the play that I couldn't really spare the writer. Mm -hmm. So he comes off as a bit of a pretentious oaf as well, you mm -hmm. know. Well, I love the uh, the scene where he's talking about having written 
novels about cops. And, yeah. and they're saying, police procedurals? No, novels about cops. cops yes. And in some respects, actually, this is that. It's a novel about cops, as, as I say. Yes, but in another place, uh, the direct asked him, do you like cops? He says, mm -hmm. yes, I do. He says, well, nobody else does. He says, I don't believe that. He says, believe it, nobody in the world likes cops. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was a lot of fun. That part of the book was a great deal of fun. And of course, I wanted to deal, excuse me, I wanted to deal with um, a very serious problem in America today, black-white mm -hmm. relations. And I thought, <clears throat> we always deal with it in terms of labels, black, white. Mm -hmm. And I thought if I could reduce it, to just two people, Bert Kling and Sharon Cook, mm -hmm. and see if uh, if they can come together. The, you know? the the questions that they ask of each other in their own minds, really, as they go along, I think, are, are very revealing. Of you know, just two people trying to sort things out. I, I like the uh, the comment at one point where uh, I don't remember exactly what happened, but he said he's thinking. I bet she thinks I'm dumb because I said, and she's thinking exactly the same thing at exactly yeah. the same time. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's just such an interesting, interesting relationship. Um, how did you, I understand, I read somewhere that you were, you were reading a book, um, what's it called, Black English. Black English. Was that, was that in research Not for a this? Book. Yeah, many, many books. Many uh, books? About uh, Black English. I, I wanted to do a scene. I don't know who told me this. I think I was having a problem with my voice, as I'm having now, after a book tour. And I went to a voice therapist who was mm -hmm. giving me exercises, mm -hmm, yeah, you know, that kind of jazz. And uh, I don't know how we got onto this, but, but she mentioned something about uh, uh, code switching. And I said, what's that? And she said, it's what uh, uh, blacks will occasionally do uh, to... Uh, They'll switch to uh, an impenetrable black Engl English that's almost a patois hmm. uh, in order to um, uh, be uh, not understood, mm -hmm. uh, not understood by the white man. And uh, I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And, and I went to the library. She gave me a list of some books to look for. She gave me some pamphlets, et, et cetera, on black mm -hmm. English. And then I went to the library and got tons of material on black English. And it really is very hard to understand. And it occurs not only in, in, uh, in the ghetto, but among educated and, and uh, professional blacks. They will sometimes unconsciously switch mm -hmm. to black English. And uh, I wanted to do a scene in the book. It, it became something else, because I couldn't master the black English. As hard as I tried, I, I, could, I could understand what was going on and, and its, its roots in African uh, 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 tribes and all that, mm -hmm. but I couldn't make it impenetrable. Um, and I wanted it to be impenetrable so that Kling, the white cop, would feel excluded from mm -hmm. the conversation. Instead, I had a, a conversation between uh, Sharon Cook, who's, who's a deputy chief surgeon and a, a doctor, between her and another doctor mm -hmm. about someone who was, uh, was injured, and, and this excludes Kling. This makes right. him feel outside. Yeah, I think one of the... Um one of the things that I think is interesting about the relationship is, it, at least it struck me this way, that um, Kling isn't, isn't so concerned, at least it doesn't seem that she's black initially, is that she outranks him, which yeah. I think is kind of interesting in, the, in terms of the police relating to each other. Yeah, she's more concerned about the fact that he's white, or, right. or at least so it seems mm -hmm. at this early stage of relationship. We may discover later on, if this relationship indeed continues into other books, mm -hmm. That there are more layers to this than we suspect, and that Kling may may really be prejudiced. I don't know. Maybe he is. Mm. I don't know. Or unconsciously prejudiced, and and this may be a thing between them if if the relationship continues. That's up to them, not me. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, I I see a lot of levels here that I can explore, and a lot of levels that relate to the way white people and black people actually view each other in America. Mm. You know, I I really feel that. Uh, Unless we do so, unless we really come to grips with this sooner or later, it's been a long, long time now, you know, to be kicking this around the block. Yeah. And we've got to get together, or, or we're gonna, we're gonna fall apart. The whole nation will fall apart. Yeah, communication d is is absolutely essential, and I, I, I think about the uh, that um, dialogue, that patois that you were talking about, being impenetrable, 
um, sometimes it seems like it's a purposeful switch, you know, that, that people do that in order to tune you out, and somehow we have to, to try and eliminate the need oh, for sure. people it's to go It's code switching. Code switching, yeah. They, they switched to a code. Yeah. It's a code that, that we don't understand, white people don't understand. Mm. Um, go ahead. No, I, I, was, I was only going to say that uh, I hope they do get, the, well, I don't want to give away too much of the book, but, uh, you know, throughout, it's, it's a real, they, they're really struggling to mm -hmm. uh, find a way to, uh, to find some common ground in this thing. And, Absolutely. And, uh, and, and um, it also kind of calls into to, uh, question for Steve Carella, his relationship with Bert Kling, to some extent. Because you know he's he's a little bit concerned that Bert hasn't kind of fully informed him of the lady that he's dating, the new love in his life, being mm -hmm. that they're partners, mm -hmm. uh, being all in Cheryl. You know he finds it a little bit odd that he's uh, talked to uh, Artie, Brown Artie Brown about that, but not not him. That's kind of interesting too. It's just shifting going on. It's yeah, kind of and you know, Corella wonders, does Kling think I'm uh, that I would? Be upset that he's dating mm -hmm. a black woman. Uh, what what does he think of me anyway? Yeah, and uh, and of course because uh, the race relationship uh, is important to the book, I had to bring in a bigot, you know, Fat Ollie Weeks mm -hmm. from from the other books, mm -hmm. to point that aspect of it out. There's a wonderful scene where um, um, it's a scene of another murder in the book, and and the, there's a there are two black cops from another precinct investigating the murder when Fat Ollie Weeks arrives on the scene. Mm -hmm. And he says, uh, he's reading the guy's uh, ID from his card, a clip to his lapel, and I forget what the cop's name is now, the, det the black detective's mm -hmm. name, Henry or something. And uh, Fat Ollie Weeks says, why don't, you go, why don't you just go home, Henry? And he makes it sound like a racial slur, you know, mm -hmm. why don't you just go home, Henry? <coughs> <laughs> yeah, he's... A very despicable character. He, he seems to be hateful, no matter you know what what you are, whether it be male, female, black, white. You know. Oh, he's a f equal employer racist. He mm. hates everything. He's just a bigot all the way down the mm -hmm. line. It doesn't matter whether you're Jewish or black or Italian. He hates anything that isn't Ollie Weeks. Mm. He has an interesting section of uh, of dialogue though with one of the the actors in the play, um, Mark. Riganti. Mm -hmm. Riganti, um, who I think was kind of interesting, had a little little bit of a resume in there, uh, having acted in several real movies, uh, which were all movies based on your novels or yes. movies that you had, had done the screenplays for, uh, which I love the, the way you blur the reality and the fiction of that. But is again, is, is their dialogue of how to conduct an interrogation or an, in, in, uh, an interview. Yeah. That's a very funny scene. Yeah. I thought. Yeah, it was it was it was delightful. I've seen it excerpted somewhere. Uh, that oh, did particular you? section. Really? Yeah. I don't remember offhand where he it was. He picks uh, Fat Ollie Weeks comes to question him and, and uh, he's rehearsing he's reading the lines in a scene where he's interrogating a woman and a suspect. Mhm. Mm Cuz the, the characters in the play are called the detective, the actress, the uh, playwright, whatever. And uh, so he starts picking Ollie's brain about how would you how would you conduct this investigation and, and Ollie of course is you know he doesn't, he doesn't have an approach or he doesn't prepare he's just mm -hmm. a cop and it's a very funny scene. It where, is, it is where very good. Ollie is uh, is telling him how he would do the thing. I want to go back to something that you said a little bit earlier about um, the characters and what they're doing and. and you don't know. Um, other other authors that I've had uh, the pleasure of talking with have said that, to a varying degree, the the characters that are in their books completely take over and do very very surprising things. Mm -hmm. They have absolutely no idea what's going on, and that for them, when they actually hit the word processor, they're in whatever physical location that the book is taking place. They're there. They're kind of observing, and just sort of keystroking, if you will, while everything is happening around them. They're, they're writing it down. Is that the way that um, you're writing Most of the time. I'll start a novel. I usually start a novel with a title. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I use that as the inspiration and also as a focus throughout. Mm -hmm. So that I'll know if the title of the book is Romance and I start straying too far afield, I'll say, mm -hmm. hey, fella, the title is Romance. Let's get back to romance and mm -hmm. various romances and the play and whatever. But um, I'll, 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 I normally will jump right in and, and either start with a body or someone about to become a body. Mm -hmm. 
and um, and go from there. And I'll, I'll carry it as far as my invention and, and energy will go, and, and then I'll stop. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, well, where are we now? I'll, on the computer, I will almost talk to myself, a dialogue with myself. Well, where are we now? What, what do we know? Uh, what has happened? Mm -hmm. It's sort of an outline in retrospect. Mm. And um, um, what do the cops need to know? Where are they going to go from here? What's going to happen next? And I'll outline maybe one or two chapters ahead. Okay. And Is move them into that and see where that takes them because things happen, you know. Uh, people arrive on the scene and it changes the entire perspective. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I didn't know wh when I sent Eile um, um, Sharon and, C and Kling on the first date, mm -hmm. I didn't know that she was going to get up and, and suggest that they go home instead of going to a movie, that she was going to say it's late and good night, I had a nice time. I didn't know that. It's just the, the direction and the feel of, of where yeah, they were I taking Yeah, I just thought, wouldn't it be interesting if, well, he said something at the table that bothered her. Mm -hmm. and As so often happens. <laughs> yeah, and she said, you know, it's been a nice night, and let's call it a night. Mm. night. So, but I didn't know that was <coughs> going to happen. I, I thought maybe I might play the first date, and they get along fine. He says, can I see you again, and whatever. I didn't know that was going to happen hmm. until it happened. Do you, um, as far as as far as when you're when you're writing and you've got, you know, outlining a little bit ahead, you've got an idea to start with. Um, when in all of that do you start to do some some research? I know you've got an awful lot of background in this, so you probably you know have a great head start on a lot of it. But if you need to research something in particular, um, well, when in, in this particular book, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the things that I had to research. The DNA. Mm -hmm. I had to research, this came toward the end of the book, of course, I had to research um, um, a, the kind of a deal a DA would cut with mm -hmm. someone who's uh, uh, being charged with a crime, mm -hmm. um, and how they go about that, so mm -hmm. that it, it seems realistic. Um, let me think of some of the other things in the book. I had to research all the, uh, the warrant when uh, uh, Teddy Carella gets in, in trouble with uh, uh, the law. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. That was research in the warrant, what they were charging her with, and how she has to appear, and all that. The very specific that was research. research yeah. yeah, very specific. Um, in other books, what I will do, I'll sort of wing it. Um, if I have to do a scene, as an example, where a fighter pilot is, is uh, flying an F 14 or whatever he's flying, mm -hmm. um, I'll wing it. He grabbed for the Schmear case and pulled it back toward the opera and then switched the trigger from it on the cremis. And, uh, and then I'll research it after that so that I am actually in the cockpit of the plane and know where all the levers are and, mm -hmm. and what the control panel looks like and all that. But I'll, I'll go for the content of the scene rather than the details of it and, and then fill that in later. Or very often I'll just write uh, scene missing mm -hmm. if I don't know. Um, scene on a boat, for example, and I know the details of the boat and it's too complicated to fake, mm -hmm. I will just put scene missing and I'll, I'll say uh, uh, Matthew Hope uh, sailing the boat across the sound and come back to that later. Okay, interesting. Now, do you, I understand that in the past too, you've, you've done a lot of um, traveling with police um, on the beat. Do you still do that at no, all? Not no, not any longer. I stopped doing that one night in, uh, in Houston. I was doing a pilot for a film about the, uh, a movie. It was a pilot for what was going to be a television series mm -hmm. about the Houston police. And uh, I was riding with them uh, and trying to find out what they were all about. Mm -hmm. the, the cops are pretty much the same you know, all over the United States. There's the same mentality, the same among many of them honor, sense of honor and mm -hmm. obligation to the job and, and uh, a, a, a desire to make a change. You hear a lot of cops say that, I'm in this because I want to make a change. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I was riding with them at, at 2 o'clock in the morning and, and we got a man with a gun call. And we pulled up, it was a convenience store in a very bad neighborhood and the woman was hysterical because the guy had come back twice that night with a gun and mm -hmm. threatened her and, and he was in the alley with the gun. And we got out of the car, and the two cops in the car, and me, and they drew their guns, and it, we head into the alley, and I suddenly realized that 
there were three guys with guns there, and I was the only one without a gun. And I thought, I don't really have to do this anymore. And I went back to the car mm -hmm. and sat in the car. And I thought, I know. Uh, I don't have to get the feel of cops anymore. I have the feel, you know, and, and I know how they work. No more. No more alleys. Mm. Sounds like a very, very safe approach to, uh, to take. And, uh, well, know. I think so, maybe. If, if there were things I, I felt I could learn by, by riding with them again, but I know the way they talk. I know mm -hmm. the way they think. And the only stuff I try to keep up with is all the scientific advances that, uh, that one has to know mm -hmm. in, in order to write accurately about policemen. Yeah. Speaking of scientific advances, I wanted to, to ask you, <coughs> um, I just read in uh, one of our local papers um, a reference to someone saying that um, the, uh, there was a book called The Turner Diaries in 1978, and they, they made the comment about this book being a source of inspiration for the Oklahoma City federal building bombing, which mm -hmm. is now just a little over a week ago. And I know that uh, there's been some um, comment about one of the, uh, you know, some information of one of your books as being related yeah. to the uh, sarin attack in Japan. Yeah. And I, I guess I'm just kind of wondering if, if you think it's, it's reasonable to assign that kind of um, causality to a book. I, I'm not sure. L let me explain what happened first, so so people don't think I'm behind the uh, the gas attack in the, in the Tokyo <laughs> Hope subways. We don't, we don't want to convey that impression. I, I wrote a uh, I wrote a novel called uh, Scimitar, Scimitar. Mm -hmm. and I and I used a pseudonym on it because it w I wanted to try an experiment. Uh, I, um, I wanted to see if I could write a good book and not be Evan Hunter or Ed McBain, but John Abbott, mm -hmm. and see what would happen. See if anything would happen at all. If if the publishers were committed to advertising it, and, and, and which they were, mm -hmm. and see if it would if it would fly, and it didn't. It was just it got good reviews, and it was a good uh, thriller. It was not a cop novel. It was mm -hmm. uh, or a, a mystery in any sense. It was an, a novel of intrigue and suspense, and and uh, it was published in Japan about nine months ago. Mm -hmm. That would have made it. Uh, well, what's nine months from April of 95, back in whenever? October of last year, Some, September of last year. year. And uh, immediately following publication, almost immediately following publication in Japan, uh, in a little prefecture some 90 miles north of Tokyo, mm -hmm. someone released sarin, the nerve gas. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the book, the assassin's weapon of choice is nerve gas, sarin, mm. which he makes in his own kitchen from uh, chemicals he has purchased in much the same way that I purchased them when I see if it, when I was trying to find out if it could be done. Mm. And you purchased them with no problem? Oh no, none at all. Yeah, that's uh, well, scary. some of them were rather simple. You know, some of, some of the ingredients were uh, alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, which mm -hmm. has no water in it, because water is a deadly enemy of sarin. It, it dissolves. It, destroys the gas. Hmm. Um, so those w those I understood how I could order from a, a, a chemical uh, supply house without any problem. Mm -hmm. But the deadly ingredient in sarin, I, I also ordered that from a chemical supply house. I called. Mm -hmm. I gave them my uh, a corporate credit card number. Mm -hmm. um, I, they asked me did I want it uh, one day FedEx or two. I said one day. And they called about 20 minutes later, I guess, but I had already coached my secretary. And they wanted to know what we need, what we were going to use it for. And she said, oh, I don't know. I'm new here. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he said, well, can you tell me a little bit about what you do? I said, oh, yeah, they conduct a lot of experiments here. And uh, he said, do you know what this is going to be used for in what experiment? She said, I think they're trying to induce cancer in white mice. Hmm. Okay? And that was that. And they sent it. It arrived the next day, marked hazardous material. Mm -hmm. It was a sealed ampule of this uh, highly toxic material, a sealed ampule, not with a cap that you could unscrew, mm -hmm. but you would have to use a, uh, a glass cutter to okay. cut off the top of the cap. And there it was. I wasn't foolish enough. I now had all the ingredients I needed to make sarin, including stuff I had got from the hardware store, a solvent that, uh, that would not destroy any of the other chemicals. And I wasn't foolish enough to try to make it because, uh, you know, I know if you get a drop on your, on your hand, it's mm -hmm. neat. 
but uh, it could be done. The thing I did in the book, I, although I gave a formula in the book purporting to be the formula for sarin, mm -hmm. the key ingredient, the one I got, I ordered from a, a, a chemical supply firm, was a non. I, I changed it into a non-existent chemical. I worked with a research chemist, and I changed it. We invented a non-existent chemical. Hmm which if you tried to make sarin with that, it, it just wouldn't work. It's like two plus two equals five. There's mm -hmm. no such chemical, so you can't make it. You know, it's like H21 instead of H20. Okay. It's impossible. Except it was very much more complicated than just changing a simple thing. It was just non-existent. But nonetheless, the Japanese linked it to the book. Mm -hmm. And they thought it was a copycat uh, who had uh, uh, taken the formula from the book and used it. Yeah. It and and mm -hmm. then uh, they spoke to me. They spoke to John Abbott in any case. Mm -hmm. And then the big thing happened in the Japanese subway. You <coughs> know, with uh, a lot of people getting hurt and killed and, and injured. And I then I really got concerned. And I thought I better tell them I'm Evan Hunter and and that uh, you know explain exactly what happened, mm -hmm. so that they'd know I, I was not responsible for this. As it turned out, I was not anyway. It, it's yeah. It's 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 very interesting. I think I remember reading a comment that you had made uh, at one time that that the terrorist mentality, terrorists are terrorists. They're going to figure out how to make this stuff oh, sure. some way or another. With uh, they're not. They know how. I yeah. mean, I don't have to tell terrorists how to make sarin. They know how to make it already. Yeah. As w as the cult had what? How many gallons of it in their in their basement with with yeah. actual guys making it in the lab, not on a kitchen table. So they know how to do this. So yeah. Terrorists know how to do whatever they want to do, as as has become evident in Oklahoma City. Yeah, which and again, I guess it, it goes back to perhaps it's it's kind of uh, specious to assign, you know, an origin of that to in a particular book. We're, we're Although you know, Bruce, in in World War II, mm -hmm. uh, when they were doing the uh, the uh, creating the atomic bomb at Los Alamos, a guy mm -hmm. came out with a book hmm. detailing how to make an atomic bomb. While they were still developing it, and rap, 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 a knock on his door. I the imagine. FBI is visiting him. How do you know about this? They thought he was tapping into Los Alamos. And he just come up with an. He had just yeah invented it himself. That's that's kind of scary, kind of intriguing in and of itself. Um, we're kind of kind of rapidly running out of time here. We've just uh, got about a minute or so left. Shall I want to sing a little. If you want, <laughs> that'd be fine. Um, we, we can go out on a high note or a low note, as there the case may be. But I wanted to ask uh, what, what you're working on now, very briefly. Um, we've got about 30 seconds okay. or so left. I have an Evan Hunter novel, novel coming out next February mm -hmm. of 96 called uh, Privileged Conversations. Mm -hmm. And I'm working on a new uh, novel about the lawyer, Matthew Hope. I have about 200 pages, and that, I don't know when that will be published, but I'm going to finish it and turn it in. Wonderful. Well, I look forward to both of them. Um, Ed McBain, the new novel is Romance. Thank you so much. It's been a great Good pleasure. Good being here, Bruce. Thank, Thank you. you very much. presentation of the Hennepin County Library.